Kirby Dick joins me now in Studio Q. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks for being here. So you've tackled the issue of sexual assault in the military in your film, Invisible War, as I mentioned in the introduction. How did sexual assault at college campuses grab your attention? Well, um, I made the film with my producer, Amy Ziering, and after we finished The Invisible War, we started making another film, um, completely unrelated to the subject matter. But as we, part of getting The Invisible War out, we took it on campus tours. Amy would go to some campuses, I would go to the others. And it seemed like every time we presented the film at the Q&As, the discussion would start around sexual assault in the military and then quickly move to sexual assault on college campuses, people saying, it happened here. Um, and in some cases, administrators seem to be very fearful of even talking about it. So we got back together, we would compare notes, and uh, we were sort of taken aback by that. Then we started getting letters and, uh, and emails saying, please make a film on this subject, I was assaulted. And it, you know, we could see that something was really bubbling up, that something that had been covered up for a long, long time, and it really seemed uh, that we sort of respond to the call and, and make this film. Wow. I mean, the numbers are staggering, right? Yeah. One in five uh, women on college campuses. Right. I, I, you know, in our, in, our, in our film, we say 16 to 20 percent of undergraduate women are sex, sexually assaulted on college campuses. And those numbers have been relatively consistent uh, over the last 30 years. And they literally called out to you to make this make this yes, film. Exactly. What were your feelings at that time about the challenge ahead of you? Well, it was a. I mean, we quickly realized that this was not a problem on just a few campuses. It was a problem on you know college campuses across the country. And uh, so the the challenge was how we convey that because it's easy to focus on a few. And and I think the press who have done have started doing a really good job on this are really focusing on some. But we wanted people to walk away thinking this is a problem on all campuses. In fact, if we chosen to, we could have just randomly chosen a school and made a feature film on it, and we would have had enough, enough material to make a very powerful film. That's how, uh, how um, extensive the problem is. That's how pervasive it is. Yeah. Wow. Your documentary focuses on the inability or lack of will, shall we say, uh, exhibited by colleges and universities when it comes to dealing with sexual assault. How do the victims you spoke to say that they have been treated by their schools when they report their experiences? Yeah, I mean, it's it's appalling to hear the, the stories of these survivors who, you know, trusted their institution to do the right thing. Um, they're victim blamed. They're told they can't go to the police when, in fact, they can. Um, th their cases are stalled, um, forgotten about. Um, some In one case, uh, a survivor was told, you know, the, the assault was just evidence that her assailant loved her. Mm. What do you even say to them? Well, I mean, <laughs> that... It, it, uh, it it's, it's speechless. astonishing. And, and, and this is one of the things that was so shocking is, you know, we uh, contacted well over 150 survivors. We interviewed 70 on camera and we would hear the same kind of stories over and over and over. And each time you thought, no, the school is going to do, do the right thing. And in almost every case, they didn't. How can that be possible? Well, schools are incentivized uh, to keep this covered up because they're so concerned about their reputation. They're concerned about getting top quality applicants to the school in, in large numbers. They're concerned about getting donations. Um, and so in schools across the country, they put the reputation, their, their own reputation over the health and safety of their students. In a lot of cases, some of the victims that appeared in your film said that the way they were treated by their schools was worse than the actual attack they experienced. Yeah, it's and it's a second betrayal. And and keep in mind, these students have chosen the, the school that they went to. I mean, out of many, many schools, probably, uh, along with their families, it's a whole family effort. And they, you know, this is their dream school in many cases. And so they, they trust their dream school to do the right thing. And this is why the betrayal is so profound. Mm. You have focused on a couple of families, and particularly yeah. you bring up the idea of parents what are parents' reactions to sending their kids off to these places of higher learning and then finding out what's happened to them? Right. No, it's parents are devastated. Um, and, uh, you know, we wanted to include parents in this film because parents, you know, the, these, these uh, survivors are often very young, 18, 19 years old. The parents are still very much a part of their lives. Um, and so, you know, when the school does nothing, the parents as well are devastated. The whole family becomes devastated. Yeah. The family and the victims, what toll have you seen this take on victims of sexual assault? 
Well, I think this is something that's not well understood that uh, about sexual assault. That uh, in so for so many people, it's, it's something they, that they have to live with the rest of their lives. I mean, it's why the term "survivors" was was chosen. Um, people sometimes say to people, "Well, why don't they just get over it?" Okay, yes, maybe the assault was bad, but you can just move on with your life. And it helps if the institution that you report to takes care of you. That's actually a big help. But when the institution doesn't, it compounds the reaction. And in fact, in many cases, it, it's the institutional reaction that creates the PTSD, not the initial assault. Mm. We're going to get to weigh some of the ways that schools have reacted to these issues that you're bringing to light. But I feel like first it's important to point out you use the word people when you're talking about victims of sexual assault on college campuses. And um, I have to admit, I'm, I'm guilty of this. So often we think of it in terms of women. And in your film, you do this so beautifully where you have all these personal accounts from women. You know, we see a dozen of them. And then we see a man on screen and you don't make anything of it on screen, but you can literally feel the temperature in the theater change and you can feel everyone around you in the audience shift by an inch because we don't yeah. think of it in that way. No, it's, it's and, and this is an, what makes it so uh, difficult for men to uh, report because the, you know, there's this notion in, in our society that men have to be strong, that men wouldn't let this happen to them. And, and so men are even more reluctant to report and we don't even have really accurate numbers on how many men are sexually assaulted. Mm. Uh, the idea that people are supposed to be able to fight back or be strong enough applies to to women too. We hear that so sure. often, and yes. you've got accounts in your film of women who have been drugged. They've had their heads smashed against walls, and yet they're still asked by higher education administrators, "Why didn't you fight back against your attackers?" Right. Um, I mean, there's well, what what in many cases people don't understand is so many of these assaults are uh, committed by someone they know and often trust. Oftentimes. They're committed by uh, when when the uh, the survivor is incapacitated. So there is absolutely no way to, to fight back at all. Um, in fact, most of these assaults are caused by repeat offenders, serial predators who who do this again and again. And they they actually target um, their victims. They pick up somebody who's vulnerable, who might be trusting. Many of the assaults happen in the first few weeks or months because people are naive. Um, there's an expression, date rape, which we've heard, you know, over the last 30 years. It's more appropriate, I think, in this situation to use the word target rape. Hmm. I want to talk about one of the more disturbing accounts that we see in the film, Lizzie Seberg. Can yeah. you tell us her story? Well, Lizzie Seberg um, went to St. Mary's College, which is the sister college to Notre Dame. And, um, I mean, she was very happy to be there. Um, and she was, I um, went over to an athlete's um, uh, apartment just thinking nothing, just thinking they were getting together. And, and uh, you know, he assaulted her. And, you know, she, again, people, you know, she trusted the school. She came forward. She reported it. And the school did nothing. I mean, uh, you know, it took two weeks to actually interview the assailant, even though the, the assailant was a football player who played in two home games where there were 80,000 fans at each game. You know, everybody, everybody at the school, everybody watching national television knew where, where he was, but the, but the school could not interview uh, her. And so it became, uh, interview him. So it became very apparent to her that the school was going to uh, do nothing and, and that he was going to completely get away with it. And so um, several weeks afterwards, she committed suicide. I mean, she was just so devastated and so distraught that she committed suicide. We interviewed her father, uh, Tom Seberg, um, and it's it's just heart wrenching to you know hear a father t tell this story. Um, but it's important because I think it's for two reasons. One, families are a part of this, and for another reason, there are a lot of suicides. I mean, we 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 only mentioned two, but we knew of at least a half a dozen, and there are probably. Uh, dozens, hundreds, perhaps thousands that we don't even know about. How does Lizzie's school respond to her suicide? Well, they tried to blame her. You know, they, they you know, called her unstable. They wouldn't meet with the uh, family. Um, they got attorneys involved. Um, I mean, here we're dealing with Notre Dame. I mean, this is one of the most prestigious and acclaimed religious schools in the United States. And, um, you know, espousing a faith that is really about protecting the weak. And, and I mean, I think the Catholic Church as much as any other religion uh, stands about for protecting the weak. And here we have someone who's weak, and, and they're the, most, this, the, the sort of flagship institution in the United States does not protect that person. That's what's wrong. I mean, they did not live up to their values.
why are higher education institutions so reluctant to pursue sexual assault perpetrators? You know, they don't want to be, quote unquote, known as the rape school. They, they don't want to uh, have any, you know, indication that there's a sexual assault happening on their campus. This is happening on all campuses. In fact, the schools that actually, you know, are more transparent and report these sexual assaults are probably safer places. So when you, when you see numbers where there's more rapes at one particular school reported than the other, where, it's, where more rapes are reported, it's safer because that means that the students feel more comfortable about coming forward and, and, and reporting their rape, and, which, and that's a testament to how the school is treating them. So what we're looking for is we're looking for presidents to step forward and take responsibility. And, you know, on camera, in the news, um, on television, to say, you know, I'm, I'm aware that this is a problem on my campus, and I'm here to, you know, assure you that I'm going to do everything I can to stop it. And when you see presidents doing that, when, they, when you finally see their faces discussing this in public, that will be the first sign that things are really getting better. And let's set up just how daunting a task that is, because you tried to speak to some of them for your film. Right. And the reaction you got was? In most cases, they were uh, either did not respond to a request to speak at all, or they declined the interview. Uh, and this is common. I mean, this is, this is, it's so rare to see a president speaking out about this publicly on the record. You, you know, you, there's so few have spoken out over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Even when they have conferences on it, national conferences, no press are allowed. I mean, where presidents actually come and, and speak, and, and they tout, uh, you know, there's one at the, uh, UBA, I believe, when they t they touted, you know how uh, uh, you know how important it was that they were doing this conference, but press being allowed, not at all. Why? Again, they just uh, they don't want to be. They don't want the, 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 the you know they're the sort of the face of their institution. They don't want it associated with sexual assault. That's a way of covering the problem up. They have to. All schools have a problem. They have to step forward and say they, you know, they have this problem. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around what the driver might be for not wanting to be known as the the rape school. Can we just assume that it's simply economics? Well, I think that's a large part of it. The bottom line, I mean, the reputation and economics are so closely tied. Obviously, I mean, if a school has is prestigious, it gets you know very high quality uh, applicants. It gets you know the numbers of applicants increase. Uh, it also gets you know donations from alumni uh, and those you know particularly in the United States that. Those are so important for colleges and universities. Um, you know, they're, they're essential to the, you know, our, our higher education system. But again, you cannot put reputation over the health and safety of your students. Mm -hmm. you, well, you also hear some of these colleges and universities say that they won't expel somebody immediately because allegations may be false. What do you say to that? You know, in the in 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 a small minority of cases, allegations are false. It's uh, two to eight percent of. Uh, it's reports of sexual assault are false, which means the, the remainder of them are true. Okay? 92. 92 to 98% are true. So, um, you know, I think, I think this, uh, our society has this desire to, to imagine that men don't do this, you know. But the reality is when somebody is reporting a sexual assault, it most likely is true. And it's important that universities respond with a sense of soliciting this information as if it's true. That's best practices. If you disbelieve a survivor, you will not only will you not get the truth, but you will destroy that person. As we saw with Lizzie and so yes. many of the other women yes. that you spoke to and men. Right. Um, but I just want to say that, um, you know, there's, uh, there's been a discussion, a, a great discussion in the media about men being falsely accused. And we obviously, I mean, that's a horrible thing, right? And so... But what has to be done here, rather than say, you know, we don't have a problem, which is just going back to the same position we've had over the last 40 years, it has to be for schools to, to uh, put money into their investigation and adjudication systems to beef them up so that when somebody does assault, they have professionals in place to investigate them and find them responsible and then expel them. And then in the few cases of false, where people are falsely accused, those same investigative and adjudicative process will protect the person falsely accused. So it's a win-win. So the schools, rather than running away from this, have to run toward it. Mm -hmm. We should also note that even for the number crunchers out there, your film raises the really interesting point that fal false reports 
are no more likely when it comes to sexual assault than they are for any other crime that's reported. R- right, which, raise, which raises the question, why aren't we talking about all the false reports of carjackings or yeah. all the false reports of robberies? I mean, this is a way, when you start, I mean, again, false report is an important issue, but when you start just trumpeting that and, and focusing on that alone, you are participating in covering up the real problem, which is that, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of sexual assaults that are going on you know, across the U.S. and Canada every year in colleges. So these are criminal assaults. It could be argued that they should be pursued through avenues of the police, not through colleges. What do you say to that? Well, uh, colleges have a responsibility to keep their campuses safe. Uh, Absolutely, the police is an option. In fact, when somebody reports a sexual assault on a college campus, they have the option of going to their college or to the police or both. Okay. Colleges are obligated when they hear of a sexual assault to investigate it, even if the person doesn't want to investigate it. Because why? Because it's most most uh, it, most men are not sexual assailants. Most of these assaults are called by caused by a small minority of men who assault again and again. So if somebody reports a sexual assault, it's very likely that person has assaulted before, and that person will assault again. So it's incumbent on the school to get uh, to do whatever it can to find that if if they have assaulted, to find that person responsible and expel them. Now the police, it's a different option. And, and uh, there are problems in the United States with police because sometimes there's victim blaming among police. And, and sometimes even when the investigation is done right, the prosecutors uh, don't want to take this case forward because they don't think they can win a case and they really want a high ratio of, win, you know, of winning cases. So they sometimes don't, case, don't case, take cases forward when they should. So, but it, and if the police don't, the, the schools still have this rep- responsibility to keep their communities safe. It's difficult to think of the legal system in terms of uh, somebody taking on a case or not taking on a case based on their ability to win it. Why is it so hard to win a case where a woman or man who's a victim of sexual assault needs to be believed? Well, a lot of these assaults in school, they're, you know, they know they're assailants. So they just think somehow they either they're lying about their assault or they were somehow responsible. If there's alcohol involved, somehow, you know, when somebody's been drinking, they blame the victim. I mean, you, it's 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 absurd. I mean, uh, you know, people should ha- have a right to go out and enjoy themselves and party without being the, the fear of sexual assault. And we should have a society and colleges and university where that doesn't happen. In the film, you focus uh, a lot on two victims of college sexual assault, Andrea Pino and Annie Clark, and they're traveling to colleges highlighting the issue. Can you explain what they're doing? Well, um, uh, the a- Andrea and Annie um, uh, are uh, were went to the University of California. I mean, I'm sorry, the University of uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill. Uh, they were both assaulted there. Um, particularly when Andrea came forward, she experienced the same thing we were discussing: this victim blaming. She tried to change, you know, tried to address the problem. She knew so many other survivors. The school did nothing. So then she joined forces with Annie Clark, who'd gone to school a little bit earlier, and they de- they decided to file a Title IX complaint against the school, a federal complaint. And um, what's interesting is, you know, most of these uh, complaints are filed by attorneys. They weren't attorneys. So they read all the case law and together, because of their great education at UNC, were able to actually file a complaint against the school and get attention. And then they started getting uh, uh, contacted by survivors and activists around the country saying this happened at other schools too. And so along with those activists, they started sort of taking their their effort on the road and helping other a- activists and survivors file complaints against their schools. And that's one of the major reasons you he- this is an issue in this country today is because Annie Andrea and other activists put this issue on the map. But, you know, it shouldn't be up to students to cr- uh, create, an, uh, 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 create uh, safety on campus. It really should be up to the society. Mm-hmm. Which you're contributing to with this film. And I'm wondering when it comes to sexual assault on campuses, how does the act of filming victims sharing their stories change the conversation? Well, yeah, I think you bring up a really good point. Um, I, I, you know, you, you read about this issue in the papers now just about every day, but you don't hear the voices and you don't, of survivors. You don't see them speaking about what they have experienced, both in terms of the assault and then in terms of uh, reporting. And that's what's really important. I mean, uh, you know, I, in, in making The Invisible War and now in making The Hunting Ground, uh, Amy and I have spoken to hundreds and hundreds of survivors. And 
you really understand the issue in a much different way. And you can't understand the issue unless you do so. In fact, when we showed the invisible war uh, to a, uh, a members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they would say to us, you know, watching that film has informed me more about the, this issue than 40 years of briefings. We hope that college presidents and college administrators watch this film. They will learn a lot. Even as, and, and, you know, they, I, no one wants these assaults to happen, but they have to have the information. They will come to understand this issue in a different way. In fact, what college presidents should be doing is they should be inviting survivors of that school, of their school, to meet and have these extensive conversations. That's a sign that you believe and you trust survivors and you, learn, and you can learn from them, but it's also will teach them uh, about the issue in a way that they, in many ways, they don't know about at this point. The power of saying, I believe you. Yes, exactly. Thank you for such a powerful and important film. Thank you.